Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this evening's Financial Planning Masterclass. This is the first event of its kind brought to you by the alumni team here at the University of Bradford. I hope you are all keeping well. We're being joined this evening by alumni, students and members of staff who are all interested in, uh, in personal finance and financial planning. My name is Adina Nago. I'm the International Alumni Engagement Officer here at the University of Bradford, and I'm delighted to be introducing this masterclass um, led by our graduate, Yelena Savonina, who is a Chartered Financial Planner and Operations Director at Ebor Financial Planning. The webinar will last for about an hour and will be split into two parts. The first 30 to 40 minutes will feature a presentation by our, by our speaker, Yelena, and during the second part, we will open the discussion and invite questions from the audience. You can submit your questions using the Q&A function visible at the top of your screen. I'm delighted to say that the host for this evening's event is a long-serving alumnus who has been engaged with the university for many years. Um, welcome to MBA alumnus Tyrone Sequeira. Tyrone is currently a global customer experience product owner at the Ford Motor Company, um, and he is also the leader of the University of Bradford London Alumni Group. Now, Tyrone is experiencing a few technical issues, so she will, he, will, um, he will be joining us shortly. Um, but I would like to, to take this moment to, to introduce you to, um, um, to Yelena. So, um, essentially, um, Yelena is, um, as I mentioned, a, um, a Chartered Financial Planner and the Operations Director of Vibor Financial Planning. She holds uh, an Executive MBA from the University of Bradford, um, alongside being part of a fellowship program by the Chartered Institute um, of Insurance. As part of her current role, Yelena works with and advises individuals and corporate clients on how to build and maximize their finances, build wealth and overcome um, economic uncertainty. Combining her current work with her past experience of working in corporation tax for HMRC, Yelena is able to deliver a comprehensive financial plan to all of her clients. Without further ado, may I now open the floor to Yelena, who will commence her presentation. Thank you, everybody, for this great opportunity to present to you tonight. Um, as part of my this year's goal, um, I sort of tr um, wanted to reach out to as many people um, as possible because uh, in my daily work, predominantly, um, I engage with clients on one to one basis and I fought for an opportunity of scaling up and, and reaching out to a wide audience because in given market conditions, I appreciate how important it is to uh, give people confidence and skills to review their own personal uh, financial plan and sort of look into the future with confidence. So today's session uh, is sort of an introduction uh, to financial planning because obviously it's a, a very broad subject with many different parts to it which may be relevant to to yourselves in different stages of your life. Um, I'm sure Adina and University of Bradford will be sharing my contact details later on if you would like to follow up after this session directly. So in this workshop I would like um, to have an opportunity to touch the core areas of financial planning and I would like to start uh, with the budgeting uh, which forms a sort of basis of financial planning. Uh, we're also going to be talking about how much do you need to save up for comfortable retirement and I'll provide you with some relevant statistics and data which I think will help you inform your own financial decisions. Um, we'll also touch on the understanding of your pension statements, which if you do work in UK, um, you will be part of auto enrollment um, and you'll, you'll potentially have multiple pension schemes, which I'm sure uh, some of you will not be able to fully understand in terms of the projections and the figures that you uh, you've been given. Um, we're also going to touch off the power of compounding in terms of um, investing over a period of time and understanding risks and how delaying your financial decisions may have a, fin a financial impact in the future. I'll also provide you with a formula for success um, and I will cover um, some basic elements of protection and how that how this element fits into financial planning. Uh, to, to begin with, I would like to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, what I call a good budgeting practices. So any financial plan, if you can imagine like a building, uh, stands on the foundation and 
to begin with, uh, it's very important for you to sort of understand how you spend money, how you interact with money and what opportunities and resources you currently have uh, and what, um, what financial decisions you may be facing in the future. Uh, I like to see it as a sort of a scale um, on, on base sides where you have to balance current expenditure and sort of current demands versus the future obligations and uh, future financial security. Um, and, and the main goals of m most people would, would want to achieve a comfortable retirement, financial security throughout life, um, home ownership, and there may be some other personal aspirations that you may have in life. So breaking it down into sort of two, two parts and start to look at it this way may help, um, may help you to sort of uh, break it down to smaller components which can be analysed and addressed one by one. The power of budgeting lies in ability of you to sort of understand, first of all, how much you earn currently and your future potential versus how much do you spend. And one of the top secrets of sort of starting to build wealth and financial uh, and sort of and ensure your financial well-being is to make in, uh, to making sure that you know how you can track these two elements and you also develop habits of paying yourself first which is the very very first secret because um, majority of people they tend to save at the end of the month which after all the own unpredictable decisions uh, that you may face during a normal 30 day period may not be the best strategy versus understanding exactly where your money comes uh, comes from and where it goes. You can then, uh, if you can break it down to sort of um, this level and there are many tools available these days to make it very efficiently, whether through your banking system or you can revert back to an old style spreadsheets a type of exercise or even pen and paper may be helpful then you can understand and start to identify areas where certain expenditures can be reviewed you can identify patterns habits that might be holding you back or irrational dis or impulsive decisions and you can start to unpick um, the the budget plan and identify the goals and areas where you can start saving and one of the best ways like i mentioned before uh, is possibly looking at a setting a, a standing order uh, to a savings account or perhaps looking at investment opportunities if you do need any help with um, sort of tracking your your budgets we have a, an excel spreadsheet which i can share with you after this presentation um, and, and we can have a further discussion about this uh, but in any whichever tool you choose to choose to use that is a powerful start to to see how the two elements balance one of the uh, sort of questions that i get asked very frequently is People ask me how much is enough um, and it can relate to your shorter term goals, uh, medium term goals and of course your future, which is most commonly known retirement. I don't particularly uh, like the, the term retirement because for many people um, it's sort of it can start earlier and it's just a different phase of life where possibly you may have less uh, sources of income if you're not actively working. However, it's your active part of life and retirement um, in many instances shouldn't be viewed as basically doing, doing nothing or it, people stay very, very active during this phase of life and uh, many would like to have an enjoyable um, and good quality lifestyle. Uh, the figures in this slide, uh, there are sort of, they're broken down to three um, examples in terms of uh, statistically uh, how estimating how much different lifestyles may cost because obviously this is one of the difficult things to do because everybody is very very different but if we look at sort of an absolute minimum to to live for a single person in UK 
in retirement, um, you are looking at at least £12,800 per year. For couple, it's just under 20000 And the next slide will provide you a little bit more detail in terms of what that may entail. For more comfortable sort of retirement, you are looking as a couple between £34,000 per, uh, per year or going to the upper level is um, just over £54,000 and you'll be a better judge in terms of um, whether this any of these uh, three lifestyles resonate with you. Um, I know it may not match exactly, but I think it should give you some guidelines in terms of the level of income uh, you may need in retirement if you'd like to maintain a comfortable lifestyle. Um, and for many people, the aspiration is to achieve this level of comfort um, and sort of financial independence a lot early in life. and. Uh, perhaps not many of you would like to continue working until age 68 where, um, or indeed even later for those where state pension starts to come in, which provides some elements of secure income, um, but it's unlikely to meet these, these particular requirements. And as you can see, for a minimum lifestyle, it's a very, very basic lifestyle, which most people will not um, desire to land in this sort of category. Obviously, a lot of uh, people in UK to maintain these standards of living, but I know many of you having completed your uh, studies with the University of Bradford and further education would probably aspire to have a better quality retirement. So, I'll, I, I'm sure these slides can be shared afterwards. Um, these were intended just as a guidelines uh, for you to start sort of um, thinking about your own future and how much may be required. These are also, um, I want to mention that these are based on a certain set of assumptions and they're not prescribed figures um, and each individual uh, scenario will vary. Um, if I take a step further, you would fair, it is fair to say that um, the state pension, providing that you work for 35 years um, and you have 35 qualifying years based on your national insurance payments in UK, uh, you are looking to achieve a maximum state pension projection as, as of uh, recently I've took the figures, uh, just over 10,000 pounds per year, which means that um, it's unlikely uh, for two two people household, it, it's not going to meet your moderate requirements. It may just just about meet your, your sort of minimum, absolute minimum requirements. Um, but as you could see, the, the lifestyle associated with the minimum projection is quite, uh, I would say, very, very modest and uh, knowing many people these days would aspire to have um, you know different opportunities for travel for going out and doing things that you would enjoy so um, clearly that leaves us with the quite significant gap where um, we as individuals have to provide for our own um, retirement through different sources it could be uh, a combination of different elements, part of that will form your pension. Um, there might be rental income, um, inheritance, various other sources, and you can evaluate what those are and what's available to you. And of course, uh, general savings and investments uh, held outside pensions. So one of the first things that uh, you're all going to come across uh, if you work in UK, you will be enrolled in um, in a workplace pension scheme and majority of the pension schemes these days uh, would would be the type of scheme where your contribution together with the employer contribution will be invested um, in the selection of individual funds um, and it will be subject to investment risks and therefore there are certain decisions that you would need to make and, and need to be aware of um, because unfortunately the guarantee the era of guaranteed pensions in UK has sort of almost has stopped unless you're working in a um, public sector where some of those schemes are still available however not many benefiting from them these days uh, so the typical 
parts of your annual uh, pension statement will look something like this. This is a, an extract from one of the providers. Um, I'm sort of, I've, I've seen it, but it may be worded slightly different, um, but what I would like to point out that you will get some sort of estimate based on a fixed set of assumptions, um, and you can see those are listed um, here, which is quite a common way of presenting information. So there will be an element of inflation. It's all debatable whether 2.5% longer term is feasible for UK compare considering that we're now sort of um, over 10% and certain products experienced a much higher inflation. Um, the investment growth is assumed at 1.2% uh, per annum, which uh, in these type of projections is a flat rate of return. And as you know, investment don't, investments that don't tend to perform this way, this way and unless you're invested in fixed uh, sort of cash deposits, even for those interest rates tends to change. So these projections needs to be taken uh, with some sort of an element of caution. And many people actually find them unhelpful because it doesn't relate to your own personal circumstances. And often if you have worked in several different organizations, you may have three, two, four, five different pensions uh, if you change jobs throughout um, your working career and you have to make sense of these kind of st uh, statements taken from different, provided to you from different um, different providers in different formats. One of my uh, sort of uh, part of my job is to help people navigate these complexities and actually translate it to something which would be more meaningful to yourself. So you may want to consider uh, consolidating your pensions so you get at least less of the paperwork and, and a more combined view of your future projections. In terms of um, answering the question how how much in uh, pound and pence figures somebody may need to save for uh, for retirement, I sort of based on a previous um, projections in terms of minimum and moderate um, retirement plan, which was taken from the uh, from one of the websites which collates information in terms of um, income and expenditure required for re re reti retirees in UK and for a couple to produce a, a to generate a minimum sort of income um, I've the the assumption that you're seeing here is uh, somebody age 30 starting with absolute zero savings in their pension um, I have assumed some growth rates um, and some information Inflation, which you can see on the left hand side at 7% and inflation at 4%, which hopefully longer term will be more representative of uh, how inflation in UK uh, will behave, even though it's not guaranteed, which means that real rates of return in this projection is assumed at 3%. And if somebody sort of makes contribution for the next 30 years um, and then transitions into retirement at age 60 uh, and would like to have a gross monthly income in retirement of £1,658 would need to save now for the next 30 years £1,815 uh, per month. Um, this includes this is a gross contribution which means if you're paying into pension uh, this includes the tax relief that you already um, receive so the actual payment would be slightly less now having said that even to achieve an absolute minimum uh, sort of level of income stated in previous projection you would still require quite a sizable pot I have to say that in this particular projection, I haven't taken into account any state pension which would be paid in addition. Um, however, I have assumed that someone would retire at age 60 rather than 68. So that gives you an opportunity to sort of um, enjoy your retirement a little bit earlier. All of these projections are for information only um, and the of course, based on the set of assumptions, uh, which may not be exact, which may not happen in exact um, scenario. The reason why I projected 
for income to last for 40 years because um, we are now seeing more and more people living into their hundreds uh, uh, birthday. I, I, I am privileged that my business partner's mom turned um, 100 uh, in April, so we're actually seeing more and more people living longer, which means that your savings, uh, which you build out through throughout life, will have to last you a lot longer uh, compared to you know previous generations where uh, people didn't live as long. And now these days, people are more mobile. They continue to enjoy their lifestyle. Um, therefore, we need to plan for a much longer sort of time frame. If we move on to a more moderate um a sort of retirement uh, then again the same set of assumptions starting from um zero investment to begin with at age 30 and if somebody continues to pay uh, or save for next 30 years uh to to achieve the income of 1392 pounds uh, per month, uh, starting from age 60 for, for basically taking you to age 100 um, in retirement would require um, sort of uh, sorry to achieve the income of 2,833 would require you to save um, £1,392 per month for the next 30 years and that, that is um, just over £800,000 pot at the start of your retirement at age 60 to provide you this kind of lifestyle, uh, which, as you can see, is, is a much sort of um, larger pot that is required. And the same, um, this projection doesn't take into account the state pension, which will provide um, additional um, additional income. And the figures are based for a couple. So if, if it's a household of two people, that would be a combined saving uh, between two of you, if you would like to have this level of uh, income in retirement. Um, and that's just sort of a starting point for you to, to consider the level of contributions uh, that may be required to achieve certain levels uh, in if we make projections for a much longer period of time. The other way to look at it, and I know as I mentioned in my earlier slides, it's a balancing act between spending now and saving for retirement. Um, so many people actually choose to delay their investment strategy, sort of building up their investments until much later um, point in life, which actually creates a lot more risk and pushes them to take more risk um, as they get older. Uh, I will now run a two sets of projections uh, for you to illustrate the impact of starting to save earlier and how how this this strategy can help you to secure your financial future. So let's assume you are age 30 and you're prepared to put aside for the next 10 years 500 pounds per month um, and I've assumed um, a risk level six investment, which is just sort of just above uh, the medium um, risk level. Uh, in in this projection, you can see um, this is the phase um, where you're actually building money, and the three uh, three different colored lines. The blue one gives you sort of. Um, each line on the graph represents a a market scenario. So the uh, rather than assuming a flat uh, increase of a, a certain percentage, the investment market is likely to present you with a range of opportunities. There will be um, inevitably market upturns and downturns, and therefore you can see a variety of lines and, um, which represent a, a thousand different um, scenarios that this particular uh, software has run to sort of try and not predict, but uh, give you a range of outcomes that you may face uh, throughout this 30-year um, period. And as you can see, if you only uh, sort of uh, made contributions until age 40 and then you left your pot uh, untouched, uh, it will it's uh, it can give you 
a lot of growth because you already have built up the pot, which then going to produce growth over the 20 year uh, period. Um, and you can see that um, the, the medium projection, the blue one is the most likely one you, you would face. Um, the red one is sort of representing more disastrous outcome and the green one is very sort of optimistic if um, over 30 year period we just see continuous and um, market growth then of course that can um, leave you with lots of money at the end but I would say uh, it's quite prudent to plan for some sort of medium outcome and if we compare this scenario to somebody who has delayed their decision to make savings and provisions for the future until much later period in their life. So you, if you've done nothing until age 50 and started for the next 10 years prior to your retirement, uh, save exactly the same amount, £500 per month, you could see that how big a difference is between um, the previous projection, uh, which gave you the play line was just above 250,000. Um, and if you leave it very late, you are most likely to face um, your pension pot only building to just over 75,000 um, pounds. It's exactly the same amount of money that you are putting in um, contributions over 10 year period. However, you can see this money has been invested for a much shorter period of time and therefore it leaves you um, with the big difference between the two outcomes. Uh, hopefully um, that is quite encouraging in, in the sense that if you do start earlier, you give yourself a lot more opportunities for your portfolio to build up. And of course you can um, increase as time goes on um, and hopefully you receive a pay rise and you progress throughout your career, you may have an opportunity to save more, um, but to achieve the same level if you start late, you would have to contribute significantly larger sums of money, which may or may not happen considering that um, many people in UK tend to have late families and children um, a lot later in their life, which again would probably stretch your financial budget quite a lot. So the other elements which um, the, to incentivize savings in UK, um, if you do work, one of the most powerful ways to uh, sort of um, build up retirement provisions is through pension contributions. And, and you could see that uh, if you are basically a taxpayer in UK and you make pension contributions, the government provides the tax relief, which means that a, a much larger sum of money gets invested. And of course, uh, both your contribution and, and the government tax relief benefits from compounded growth, uh, particularly if you start um, saving early in life. The This um, next slide shows the same situation uh, but brings into uh, play if somebody is a, uh, is a higher rate taxpayer, it's even more tax advantages and effectively the same level of contribution costs you a lot less because part of um, the tax relief is reclaimed through the pension fund uh, and parts of it can be reclaimed uh, through your self-assessment. So you, that's just, that just demonstrates that to pay £7,500 a year, you only need to pay 6000 and if you are a high rate taxpayer to, to achieve this level of uh, effectively a contribution, you'd only need to pay 4,500 um, in terms of money out of your pocket. So utilizing tax reliefs um, as they are is a very powerful way of maximizing your savings, um, but you do have to consider that pension funds are not available uh, in terms of access until um, it, in the future will be 57, so age 57 you would have to wait until you reach that point and, uh, before you can touch the pension provisions. So it may be, you may need to balance it with other types of savings. And one of the other important aspects which I would like to mention is ability to do a salary sacrifice. So if you do work in UK, 
uh, majority of employers um, would allow a salary sacrifice, or at least you can discuss this option with your employer. And effectively, uh, it's an agreement between you and your employer to uh, reduce your salary. And in exchange of that, the money is diverted into your pension, uh, which makes it very, it's a very tax efficient way. And also um, because both parties make um, a saving on national insurance, um, effectively some of the employers may add additional contribution into, into your pension pot, making it even larger. Um, this arrangement is uh, permanent and it's not something you can change and alter every time you wish. So it has to be given a lot of consideration, but from the tax point of view, it could be quite, um, you know, very efficient and it's worth considering and discussing with your employer to ask them if they can facilitate it. Um, and there is more information available at the end of the presentation uh, and you can read about this particular arrangement which may be relevant to yourself um, at some point in the future. Um, salary sacrifice is also effective in a way that um, because money is never paid into your account, there is uh, less temptation to skip saving. Um, it's automatic and it's a very good way of staying disciplined. Um, but many other aspects have to be considered beco before you make a decision. Um, when we talk about investments, um, and it doesn't relate just to pensions, it also applies to um, other investments that you may have. One of the things that is important to consider is opportunity and potential for returns versus the risk, the level of risk you're taking. And as you've seen in the graphs um, which I presented before, you can have a range of market scenarios um, and it's important that you feel comfortable and fully understand the risks that you're taking. This is a very simple illustration of the most common asset classes that you may face or hear uh, when you make financial decisions. Obviously, the cash um, cash funds or deposits um, are sort of um, their less um, their least risky investments uh, obviously the returns uh, um, are usually a lot smaller um, bonds is, and, and sort of as you start moving in equity funds um, are higher risk investments and then buying individual shares such as I don't know if you go and buy Tesco shares or Barclays shares you concentrating your risk on one particular financial institutions institution where funds they aggregate um, shares and bonds from uh, different uh, and sort of um, companies which makes it less risky because if one one of them doesn't perform then at least not all of your eggs are in the same basket so uh, you can read um, more about each individual sort of asset class and and uh, how this type of investments may uh, sort of relate to your own portfolios. One of the things I would like to mention is that uh, when you in when you and your employer pays into your pension, the investment decision rests with you, not your employer. And um, if you don't make active financial sort of decisions and don't review your pensions, um, then there is a default fund. And nevertheless, uh, it, do, it does that strategy does take risk and, and I strongly encourage you to at least review and see if you're comfortable um, with the choice that either you've made or consciously didn't make um, because of a longer period of time it can have a significant impact in terms of the outcome that you're going to face um, and the in terms of strategy the way to look at financial plan is you do need a strategy. The tax will play uh, an important role in, in this. Um, investment returns uh, will depend on the level of contributions that you pay, the time you continue to invest, and of course the type of investment um, that you choose. And, and that's why um, also reviewing these things over time is very, very important. And all of these aspects, um, they contribute to the formula 
uh, of your success. So if you get the strategy right in terms of allocating your resources in the right um, sort of uh, tax wrappers and uh, have sufficient uh, emergency fund or rainy day fund, it's it's less likely that you're going to need to touch your investments when the markets are not doing so well. Um, the tax element, if you can pick up as much tax relief as you go along your financial journey, that's going to obviously accelerate and boost your investments investment returns. Um, and the, the, the review is, of course, going to make sure that your financial plan remains aligned to your goals and objectives, which inevitably, as you progress through life, will start to change and alter. And for the final part of my presentation, I would like to touch on the protection aspect because um, it's also playing a very very important part in any financial plan and in what, what we're seeing here uh, is a couple um, called Ben and Judy. Um, ben is age 35 and Judy is age 31 um, and they sort of uh, looking to retire at age 60 and they want to understand the risks um, that um, they would take if you didn't if they didn't have any sort any source of protection and what i mean by protection uh, is as they go throughout life um, this couple will face a series of of risks um, there is just over 46 percent chances that um, from their age 30 and 31, 35 and 31 until age 60, there is nearly 50% chances of um, one of them being sort of uh, off work for more than a, for more than one month. Um, there is 17.6% uh, chances of one of them being seriously ill or dying and only 5% chances of one of these um, two people dying. And if you can imagine um, how impactful it could be if um, you had 50% chances of being off work for more than a month um, and nearly 20% chances of being critically ill or um, and being out of work for a much longer period of time where your main source of income may stop and depending on the employer the provision for statutory sick pay for example can be quite um, low and obviously the risk of dying is smaller but nevertheless is quite um, impactful and what I'm trying to say is that um, making financial sort of decisions you need to consider all different factors because um, this kind of scenarios uh, can knock, um, knock knock on your financial plan on its head um, and if you're not um, prepared it can have a devastating impact on on your life and the life of your uh, beloved ones and one of the things um, i find it quite powerful is um, as individuals, we often think of protection as buying security for our home, protecting our phone. We definitely buy car insurance. A lot of people in UK um, invest in the pet insurance, but we all often neglect, neglect the source of income, which pays for the peace of mind of all other areas of life. Um, and it's very, very important um, that one of the first things you do after today's presentation of um, it, it, it's reviewing actually the resources that you already have and identifying any gaps and sort of start to think in terms of scenarios um, and, and ensuring that you will be okay if any of this um, if you face any of these um, circumstances um, one of the first things uh, is to look at your own workplace pension and uh, review it and see um, if, in, if there is any scope for additional contributions or whether salary sacrifice might be relevant and also looking under the bonnet and seeing if you're actually investing in an um, appropriate fund and um, 
uh, looking at the charges. Um, the other aspects is looking back. If you had previous employments, is it worth considering consolidating your pensions? Um, the other elements which you uh, most likely have through employment is um, provision for, for sick pay. Uh, it will be specified if in your employment contracts and you could see uh, the level of benefits your employer will pay if you were unable to work. Um, some employers will offer medical, private medical insurance, which sort of uh, gives you access to better healthcare um, rather than waiting for the NHS and death and service benefits um, is a benefit which pays out in the event of death and usually is a multiple um, of your salary. So actually making sure you have an, uh, a full understanding of the benefits that you currently have will actually help you to relate to the scenarios that I've presented to you earlier and identifying gaps and then thinking how those gaps can be sort of covered. And this this is where I think the slide summarizes it. Um, it's important to know what your resources are, what you've already accumulated so far, what your employer provides um, versus where you would like to go and uh, what, what you want to achieve and then try and marry the two together and see how closely you can align the two. And um, I like this quote because um, it sort of summarizes everything I've mentioned uh, at the start of my com uh, presentation. If you don't know exactly where you're going, how will you know when you got there? So you, having no plan um, often leaves people pondering through life without um, sort of knowing or being able to measure their achievements and um, knowing when it's enough um, and uh, where you can sort of start enjoying comfortable um, lifestyle and practical takeaways from today's session. I know it's been a very brief introduction to financial planning, um, but I just wanted to leave you with some tools and examples and as to how to start thinking about your own financial circumstances. And one of the first things I encourage you is to track your expenses, identify any opportunities uh, that you can start saving and make sure you pay yourself first. Um, creating a rainy day fund uh, will help you cope with unexpected um, events um, and making sure you don't have to dip into your uh, savings and, and investments at the wrong time. Um, utilize tax efficient investment strategies such as pensions and I'm sure you've heard about ISAs which are commonly available in UK. Uh, regularly review your financial position and future goals um, and use the resources available to sort of learn more about investment risk and investment strategies so you can understand and start sort of engaging with your financial plan in a different level and review your gaps and see if you need to seek any further protection to make sure um, that you can cope with negative scenarios that you may encounter. And of course, uh, seek financial advice to create your own personal financial plan um, to help you achieve your desired goals. And I will leave you with a couple of resources which I find um, very helpful. There are free resources available on the internet. Um, Money Helper is a, a, is a brilliant website. It covers all aspects of financial planning and presents information in a very clear uh, and concise format, very easy to read and understand. It could be a very good starting point. And Retirement Living Standards, uh, that's the website which provided the three scenarios which I mentioned at the, at the start of my presentation and you can read a little bit more about the statistics and uh, how information is compiled and what retirement may look like. And finally, I want to say that um, anything presented today, it doesn't constitute um, advice, it's, it's just sources of information and you need to, if you want to apply any of the aspects that I've covered today, you should seek um, an authorised advice um, and sort of um, take guidance. Um, and finally, um, 
Thank you for attending today's uh, presentation and um, I will be taking questions very shortly. Uh, I'd like to leave you with my details uh, and I also want to offer an opportunity for you to reach out and book. Um, I, I call them dropping clinics. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions that you may wa not want to ask in public, so I'm happy to answer uh, questions um, afterwards and uh, I offer a short sort of um, opportunity for you to discuss your personal circumstances and then we, we can see if um, I, I can be of any further help in terms of tailoring a financial plan to your individual needs. Um, I think I will hand back to, um, to Adina or Tyron for questions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Elena. That was a, a very insightful and a very engaging uh, session. I'm sure some of the methods that you talked about um, are things that are, that are preoccupying all of us, no matter the sector that we work in or the, the stage in our career that we find ourselves in. Um, I would now like to move on to the Q&A section of the of the masterclass, if that's OK. Um, I'm just going to read to you the first question. Some of them you might have covered already part of the content, but I think um, they offer a good, a good understanding of what people are concerned with. So the first question for you, Yelena, is um, where would it be best to invest your money to get the most amount of compounding? Um, I think, as I mentioned before, the, the building block starts from uh, the rainy day fund, the, the level of savings that are available, which usually means that you, you do need to maintain a certain element of cash. And then after that, people can consider uh, sort of investment strategies su such as funds. And, and it would be very important to complete your investment risk profile so you start to build understanding. But uh, to achieve better returns, you obviously need to take an element of risk. Um, it, it would be very hard to answer which specific fund or company to buy. Um, but I think if you create a layered layered portfolio um, that gives you a better opportunity not to uh, sort of catch your investments at the wrong times because they will go for ups and downs. But I think that's where specialist advice would be very important. Thank you, Elena. That's a, a, a very balanced approach, I would say, um, without knowing the person's particular um, circumstances. Now, the next question um, is about pensions. So someone in the audience is asking if you pay into a workplace pension, does it get compounded? The compounding happens um, throughout. Effectively, compounding is reinvesting the uh, returns that you get. Um, and for example, if you invest in cash, you get interest and interest if it's within the pension it gets reinvested so if you invest in funds and shares you will receive dividends which are going to get reinvested so you do benefit from um, an element of compounding naturally by participating in investments over a period of time right okay um, the next question um, is about different types of funds so someone in the audience is asking what are bond funds and equity funds? How do you start investing into them? So imagine a sort of um, imagine a company. If you in terms of bonds as a term is if you as an investor lending money to the company for, for the company to then use it to grow uh, and expand their operation. Um, it, for example, if the company goes um, bust, which does happen because not every business uh, plan works out. Um, in terms of who gets the money first, if there is anything left in the company is the people who, the the lenders to the company they they get more chances of getting their capital back um, and the bond effectively the company pays you uh, a coupon uh, or interest you can call it for the use of your money in their business if you are a shareholder in a business uh, you invest in a company and this is in is the same principle. The company uses the money to grow, um, employs more people, creates new products, um, and if that works out, you receive a dividend, uh, which tends to be um, possibly higher than uh, the interest that uh, gets paid on the, to the bondholders. But in the event of um, 
you know, if the company goes bust, then you are the last in the pecking order to receive your capital. So that's where the risk comes in in different shapes and forms. Um, you are rewarded for taking risk um, and giving away, not giving away, but um, yeah, in a way, giving away money for a time period uh, for someone else to use it um, to sort of achieve better returns and deploy the capital. So that's uh, that's in essence and the fund, it just pulls together uh, different investments in different companies as opposed to going to one particular company, because obviously the risk of that, any of those going bust is a lot higher as, as we've seen even large banks unfortunately don't survive always. <laughs> Interesting, thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, the next question is about earning more. So one of the people in the audience are asking, um, if you are a higher taxpayer, do you get a higher national standard pension, assuming you did not pay into your workplace pension? Uh, the state pension is the same for everybody. It depends on the number of qualifying years. And if you have 35 years, it's the maximum, which I presented um, in earlier. Is if you pay higher rate tax, it doesn't make it, you know, you cannot go above that threshold. So you have to save up for your own private pension uh, if you want a better pension provision. But the state, you know, you just continue to pay national insurance, but unfortunately it doesn't make state pension any bigger than anyone else's. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, now, the next question is, um, is is the following um someone is asking please may you share the budgeting spreadsheet and how it works i'm i'm assuming they're probably asking for a more specific um kind of budgeting tool that you might have access to elena so uh, in in my business we use quite a comprehensive excel spreadsheet which allows you to put in uh, all your income and then it all possible categories of expenditure and obviously you can complete it as many times as you want um you've got my email address if you drop me a line i'm more than happy to share that um, it is a tool which is available so um i'll do that after the session fantastic that's that's very very useful to know um the next question is, uh, what would you advise those who are interested in early retirement and what steps should they take? Um, I think it goes back to the earlier slides of my presentation. Um, those people who aspire to retire earlier, um, it, it's sort of you need to view it as, um, you know, whether you still want to continue working because uh, for some retirement doesn't mean completely stop working. You may have business idea um, and it's just a different lifestyle. If we're talking about somebody who wants to completely stop working, obviously you do have to build up sufficient uh, savings and investments which are going to continue to support your lifestyle. And the only way to do it is through a first of all saving, making sure you don't lose the money and then uh, finding the investment opportunities and usually it's a combination of different investments um, which uh, you know one asset class or one particular fund may not give you the outcome you would like so um, that's why diversifying your investments is often a, a very very good uh, strategy thank you elena now we have a london specific question um someone in the audience is asking is it worth purchasing a house before investing i have put off investing due to living in london so as to purchase property um it's always a very very difficult question because uh property investments um i mean there are rental properties and there is a house that someone would want to live in um the the first sort of consideration is um considering how much rental uh you pay compared to if you were a homeowner and uh Definitely, that's a, in London is a particularly difficult decision to sort of make because uh, uh, you may need to save up quite a large deposit. And uh, equally, in the future, if you have equity in a house and you're prepared to move outside London, there is always an opportunity to sell. But none of these things are guaranteed, and property maintenance remains, you know, is something you have to keep, a key, you know refreshing and uh, maintaining otherwise the the property investment um, also presents its own risks and is uh, less liquid because obviously property markets go through fluctuations where it's not always um, 
one way up, uh, unfortunately, even in London. Thank you, Elena. That's a, a really interesting take, especially at a time where it feels like there's a, a lot of societal pressure around uh, around purchasing property rather than being a renter. So it's really nice to hear a more balanced approach in terms of what's best for, for your long term kind of financial health. Um, one of our participants is asking, is there a minimum amount for compounding? Um, no, because compounding can technically start even if you place money in a, um, in a cash deposit because ultimately you can reinvest the, the interest you get. So compounding is just a sort of a term which describes the benefits of reinvesting the proceeds from your in, uh, sort of um, uh, interest and dividends from from your investments uh, rather than taking them away and, and spending. So um, it, it's uh, it, it shouldn't be con confused with the guaranteed returns because compounding is not guaranteed. It's only going to happen if the investment produces either interest or dividends or some sort of uh, payout. Um, otherwise, it's not, you know, it cannot grow if uh, the investment hasn't been successful. Interesting. Thank you. We now have another property related question. So someone in the audience is asking, should buying a property or paying off a mortgage take priority over investment saving? Uh, I would say the first thing is to uh, to consider what level of rates of interest you're paying on your mortgage, because uh, in the past we've seen very low interest rates on the mortgage and it made more sense to uh, hold back and in invest that money. Um, but one of the things I would say, if, you know, these days I have seen uh, interest rates of over 5% and I would say in given market conditions, um, in looking into very uh, like shorter period of time, it would be very hard to achieve this level of return. And if you have to pay this level of uh, interest on one hand and you've got no guaranteed return, which is more than that, then it does make sense to uh, reduce your mortgage. Um, you have to be mindful of penalties because most providers are only allow you to overpay by 10% uh, if you are on some sort of fixed term deal. So just, just three terms and conditions. But I would say compare what you're paying in terms of interest and see if that looks like achievable rates of uh, return because uh, with the investments you always take a risk um, if, if you can you know if you can get better interest rates in the bank um, then probably so you, your money is better in the bank rather than giving it back to the um, to the mortgage provider because then you lock in your equity so it really depends on individual circumstances. Fantastic. Well, this upcoming question actually relates very closely to, to your latest response. So someone is asking, how do these investments compare to an interest rate of 4% in a bank account? I'm assuming the person is asking about investments versus normal um, kind of traditional savings accounts. Um, I would say the interest rates that we're seeing currently is um, unusually high for UK because uh, you will re remember just a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year, we've seen not point not 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 percent, uh, and uh, you know we were getting no interest in the bank. Um, so and it's likely that these rates will not continue to to remain for a long longer period of time um so you, there are ups and downs sometimes for a short period of time this may give you more security and better return however the investment markets in general over a longer period of time have always outperformed cash but you have to stay disciplined and that's why it's very important to have layers in your portfolio because you don't want to be taking risk with the capital that you may need for a rainy day fund. And there is always an element of cash in any portfolio. We advocate that people do have that because there are unforeseen events happening throughout life and you don't want every penny being invested, even though that may give you a better return, uh, but equally increases chances of your risk. Um, so longer term investments tend to historically outperform cash. Nobody has a crystal ball for the future, that's why it's probably an element of diversification because ultimately when markets are down it's not a bad time to buy even though you may not get instant returns um, but when things recover because uh, the economy, economy goes through a cycle um, often and uh, in, you, you don't want to buy at the peak 
and then see it sort of dropping, which means you paid high price for the same uh, same investment which you could have bought when the market is down. So being disciplined, understanding risks, I think is very key before somebody jumps in and makes a decision, I would say. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. We're now getting around to the last two questions or so. Um, someone in the audience is asking, could you briefly explain how ISAs work? So ISA is, an, is a tax wrapper, so uh, effectively e any interest or dividends or capital growth uh, that you crystallize or when you sell the investment, if you made any of those, uh, they will not be taxed. If you don't invest in the ISA um, and you just sort of buy funds or shares directly, then they produce any dividends or interest or when you sell your investments and you make capital gains, uh, they're subject to tax depending depending on your tax rates and brackets so, and, and other income. So it could be quite high um, tax, ad additional tax you may need to pay uh, and things you need to declare in your self-assessment. So um, I suggest basically uh, shelters you from any of the taxes, uh, makes it very tax efficient. That makes sense. Thank you, Elena. And now uh, finally around to the last question. Um, someone is asking, how do you directly buy shares into a company? Uh, there are trading platforms you can uh, buy shares directly some of them allow you to execute sort of it buy through a uh, through a platform because these days is all digitalized and uh, you'll not uh, you'll not get a paper certificate it's, you, it's all sent digitally um, or you work with a financial advisor and you buy shares through through a fund um, or if you have a large portfolio it's, it's common to use a, a stock broker or discretionary fund manager but that, I would say that's more prevalent for a very large portfolios for small investors there are several platforms um, just make sure they're reputable and, and sort of trustworthy and you do a bit of a background checks on them in terms of them being regulated and you fully understand charges because uh, there will be a set of charges involved in, in those transactions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Elena. And now one last question for me, and it's more of a general question. It's just given the uh, essentially the cost of living crisis and the financial uncertainty that we all find ourselves in, what do you think is best for us to do now in the moment to kind of make small steps to our future financial well-being? I, th I think uh, starting with budgeting is uh, is an absolute uh, start in, in any market circumstances because if you don't know how much you spend and you have no control and uh, of, a, of a budget because often people find that there are certain subscriptions that they haven't they forgot to cancel there are spontaneous purchases and you you can sort of make yourself a bit more uh, disciplined in, in that way I'm not saying stop stop buying anything and uh, don't live your life but um, having a little bit more sense of control can uh, can bring a calmness and obviously it, those uh, those of you who do have some debt uh, particularly high interest and credit card debts uh, it may be worth trying to reduce those first before you start investing because often those eat, eat a very large portion of income and paying interest on on that is eating into your budget as well so um, try try address the debt situation first uh, get some caution in terms of uh, cash savings and reserves and then move on into investment strategies because you can only do one step at a time you know and sometimes that's little steps which matter over, over a longer period of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for the very insightful session um, and for, for answering all of our questions. Um, I would uh, just like to say a, a few last words before we finish this session. Um, First of all, I would like to to thank to thank our speaker, um, Yelena Savonina. The, the session has been incredible. Um, I will tell you in a little bit about her upcoming um, financial planning masterclass, um, which will happen in two weeks time. Um, but I would like to take this moment to um, to tell you all about the fact that we have a um, University of Bradford London alumni group. So everybody who is 
based in London, around London or, or down south in the UK is more than welcome to join upcoming events, webinars um, and, and um, activities organized by the London Alumni Group, who is led by, uh, by Tyrone here in the picture. Um, I would also like to tell you a little bit about the, um, the upcoming alumni events. So um, as, as I mentioned, on, on the 16th of May, uh, Yelena will be running another masterclass, which this time will uh, run, will, will dig a bit, uh, a bit deeper into the um, retirement planning and wealth maximization for those who are a bit more established in their careers. You are more than, uh, than welcome to join that session as well, because it will be, um, I think, a little bit more, um, probably a bit more in detail. Um, and also, I would like to tell you about the Academic Inside webinar, which is taking place on the uh, 9th of May, which is next Tuesday. We are welcoming uh, an academic from the School of Management, Professor Kweku Adams, who will be talking to us about multinational companies and human rights violations in emerging economies. Does commitment to corporate social responsibility matter? Alongside those uh, upcoming events, I would also like to, to um, kindly invite you to save the date. We have now um, announced that the next Big Bradford reunion will be taking place on the 30th of September 2023. This is a very large on-campus event which welcomes um, alumni from all generations and from all across the world to come back to Bradford for uh, a full day of activities, workshops and uh, interactive sessions. Um, so this is on the 30th of this September 2023. Once more, I would like to say a, a very, very warm thank you to, to Yelena um, and um, I hope you all have a very good evening ahead. Thank you.